Uh, my name is Anthony Garitano. I'm a senior software engineer at Crosscom, a software development agency based out of Durham. Uh, we make web, mobile, and immersive apps, uh, and I lead our front-end team. Um, I've been an engineer for a little under 10 years, a uh, full-stack developer, but my focus has been mostly on the front-end. I've been working with React for just about four years now. Um, I've used Angular and Vue.js as well, so I kind of have like a, a, a well-rounded view of the ecosystem. Um, but React in particular took my interest. Um, I just really, really enjoyed the way you create components and just the, the whole structure and process. And I really, really like the community that exists around React. Um, it was about a year ago this talk was born. I had a bug. I wasn't really understanding how something was being re-rendered. And one of my, or I was getting a lot of re-renders. And I didn't understand why, because it was only happening occasionally. And that began the process of me realizing like I didn't fully understand how React worked internally, um, how we started with this weird HTML-like structure and then actually ending up with DOM manipulations. Uh, so that was a journey, uh, and it seems like you too are also interested in this. So we'll go ahead uh, and get started. So this is, I just wanted to give you a quick outline of kind of what we'll be going over today. Um, it's a little bit of heady content, um, so just kind of bear with me. Things will begin to make sense if uh, you're in the middle of something like, this is so crazy. It's just, stick with me. Um, yeah. We'll go ahead and jump in. So we need to get on the same page for some things first. Uh, HTML and the DOM. I think most of us have a pretty good understanding of what this is, uh, considering the level of talk that we're in. But I just I don't want to assume anyone's knowledge level. Uh, so we'll just get some base information at play. Um, so React solves several problems. But if I had to boil it down to a single phrase or a single kind of statement, uh, React allows you to write maintainable and performant code using the concept of components. Components allow you to focus on describing the UI you want rather than focusing on the details of how the UI actually gets inserted into the page. So just baseline understanding of kind of what React's purpose is and what we want it for. Um, and so let's just break that down further so that we have an understanding of like when we start talking about why React is doing what we're doing, we understand the, the premise behind it. Uh, so when I'm trying to generate HTML, uh, I don't actually care how my nav or my buttons get inserted into the page. I don't care if it's like, using an inner HTML right or if we're using jQuery or whatever you want to use. Like that's an implementation detail, right? What I'm mostly concerned about is like I want to be able to define buttons and I want them to look the same across the board. Um, so, and then additionally, from a performance standpoint, the most expensive thing that you can do in a web browser is write to the DOM. I can create 10,000 JavaScript objects faster than I can manipulate and update styles and things like that. Because remember, we're not just changing content. Your web browser has to repaint. It has to do frame animations. It has to load network requests. And it has to handle all of this at the same time. Uh, so it's much easier just to remember JavaScript is also single threaded. So that means that everything happens start to finish. Um, so it's a lot easier to just generate a bunch of stuff and then say, hey, we want it to update. All right. So thinking of HTML and the DOM, we just want to get on the same page. Uh, all right, some super simple HTML. We've all seen this before. Um, I think it's helpful to think of a web page as a document, um, and that'll be our kind of basis for going forward. You can edit documents, right? Think of a text document. Think of a Microsoft Word document. Think of a Google Doc. Uh, you edit it using a user interface. In the browser, you edit the document, this the HTML document, with an API. That API is the DOM. We've all done something like this before get an element by ID, and then change it to an in, <clears throat> inner HTML, right? So super, super simple. Just want to make sure we're all on the same page as to how things are working. All right, so let's start diving into the meat of things. All right, so if the goal of React on the web is to generate HTML, how uh, so we have a baseline under, or sorry, a base idea of a component. And components are functions or classes that describe the UI you want to ultimately end up with. Uh, and JSX, or JavaScript XML, is the primary way that we, we write that, but we, we also don't have to. So let's take a look at an example. Super duper simple component, right? Um, if you've written any functional components at all, this is very familiar to you. We have our main element, we have an H1, has an ID of a title, and we return it. Um, so when a component runs, the result is that React creates an instance of the component. So think state, think props, right? So it's this constant living organism. So that's a component instance. The instance consumes its props, it deduces state, et cetera, and it returns an, what's known as an element. An element is a plain object describing a component or HTML tag. We haven't created HTML yet at this point. We haven't inserted anything into DOM. It's just a description 
of what we want to ultimately produce. So this return statement returns an entity that React internally calls an element. And that looks like this. It's just a plain object. So there's several properties here. You'll notice that this is a, it correlates right back to what we were just looking at. So we have main and we have an h1. h1 has an ID of title. Um, and we see that right up top. Our very first thing is a type of main. So I'm just going to go over the properties in order and it'll start making a little sense in a minute. All right, so the type property can be a string reference or uh, an H, or sorry, so it can be a string reference to an HTML tag. React internally calls this a DOM element. Uh, or it can be a reference to a component. React call this a, calls this a component element. So if its type were my component, uh, when you do import my component at the top of your JavaScript file, that's actually what would be here, a reference to that. Uh, the next property is the key. Uh, and this is used when you're manually creating a bunch of children. Uh, so when you're mapping over uh, an entity array, or sorry, an array, uh, and you're generally generating a bunch of components outside from, from that, uh, that's what this is used for. Um, this becomes really important in just a moment, so we'll dive deeper into that in a little bit. But just, just note that this is used to uniquely identify an element among siblings. Um, we'll get more into that and what that means in a second. Ref is a reference to an actual DOM node. Uh, so if you've ever used the create ref function or the equivalent hook, um, that's where this value ends up. Uh, for those that maybe are not super familiar with that, uh, a reference is so that you, you want a reference so that you can maybe focus an input. Or if you have a third party library that's writing attributes to a DOM node, um, you'd want to access those. So this is where that reference ultimately ends up. We have this uh, kind of quizzical looking type of property next. Uh, this is really interesting. Uh, this is actually a, a safety feature, uh, and it's a super, super edge case, but um, it's little things like this that make me love React and the React core team. I just I get excited when I see things like this. Um, so its value is always a symbol, and if you've not used symbols before, I, I don't really either in my day to day. Um, symbols, you, you pass in essentially a string, or I think you can pass in anything actually, and it generates uh, a unique anonymous like, hash essentially. Um, and so I think of it, you can, if you want a, an analogy, it's like a UUID almost. Um, and so the idea is that <clears throat> um, this is unique to the React app in and of itself. Um, what's important to know is that symbols, you can't have them in JSON. Uh, so remember, JSON ends up as a string, and this is a li live living object. It's an entity within JavaScript. So when you do object type of, it'll tell you it's an object. Or if you do a type of on a string, it'll tell you it's a string, right? So symbol will come back with this a type of a symbol. Um, JSON does not support symbols, so you can't transmit them um, ba back and forth like through API calls. Uh, and so this is a protection against cross-site cross scripting attacks. Uh, so like, let's say that you have a, like a compromised server that you're, that you're making an IP, API request to to get some data back. Um, if, if this is happening, yes, I know that you probably have a whole other host of issues that you need to deal with. But like, let's just say that's what the issue is. Um, and you get back some, some data, and you're trying to insert that using your, your component. Uh, React will actually just straight up reject that because every single element that gets created, it expects to have this type of property, and it expects to have it, that value of symbol with the uh, React element um, passed inside of it. Um, so if, if you get that back from an API response, just straight up rejects it, won't even render it. So it's, again, super, super edge case, but it's a, it's a nice safety feature. Somebody, this happened to somebody, and the React core team is like, oh, this is a really easy way to solve this. It costs nothing to generate a symbol. Like, there's no performance like hindrance from this. Um, yeah, so not 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 important, not a thing that you encounter every day. But I thought it was super interesting. All right, but then the meat the meat of the, of a of an element is the props, um, and so this is everything that you are accustomed to when you're creating a component. Um, in our case, we only had one prop, and I'll flip back just for reference. Uh, so it's just our H1. So it's just an object. Uh, and its type is h1. Uh, we didn't have a key, we didn't have a ref, but it had props of id, which was title, and its children was a text string of look ma. Um, children can be an object or it can be, a, or it can be an array. So if you have multiple children, um, it will be an array of those objects. So what React does is it builds up a whole tree of these uh, from every component. So this is what the renders, or a render function will ultimately return back to you, uh, or the return from a functional component.
it's kind of a quick review. Uh, we have our component. Internally, React creates a component instance state, and then that ultimately generates this object. Um, this object and its children, so going all the way down, is what's known as a virtual DOM. Um, and this is the kind of the core guiding principle behind why we want something like React. So remember earlier when I said that it was really expensive to write to the DOM, it's really cheap to generate these objects. React can just do them super fast. Uh, or insert view, Angular, they have their different ways of doing it. But the idea is that this is a very, very fast process. Um, so we can iterate really quickly. Um, it's super cheap to build these up and tear them down. Um, which is why we want something like this over just a writing to the DOM every single time we have a change. Um, all right, uh, if you'd like to see an example of an element on your own, um, this is something that you can go write in an index file right now. Uh, my, my, if you have app.js, um, JS, you just define a component. Notice that I have not made a function. This is just the JSX itself, and then you can log it. You'll actually get everything that I just showed you. Um, you'll actually also see some internal properties that we're not going to go over here. Um, there's, but just note that those are prepended with underscores, and those are for React's internal use and a internal API use. So uh, you're not supposed to use those. Um, what I also wanted to point out is that it's not. There's nothing wrong with you generating this if that's how you wanted to create your React components. This is totally valid. You can ship this. Like this is a thing that you can put inside your app and it'll run. Um, not, not really what we're going for, right? Like, this is not expressive. This is not maintainable. This is very difficult to parse. Um, that's why JSX exists in the first place. Um, but yeah, this is, I tried it when I was like building this talk. I was like, huh, who knew? Pretty cool. Uh, all right, one other thing I wanted to chat about real quick. Shadow DOM, uh, this is a thing that I get asked about a lot in, in regards to this. Uh, they're not related. So the Shadow DOM is a browser technology designed for scoping variables in CSS and web components. That's it. Not related to the virtual DOM. All right. So next in the list, we have reconciliation. Uh, creating the virtual DOM is part of the process known as reconciliation. Reconciliation is responsible for maintaining the tree of elements when a component's prompts or state change. Uh, so remember, React creates a tree of elements every time the render function is called. That's ultimately what we're getting back. So to be efficient, we need, to tell a way, we need a way to tell what's different between the two trees so that we're only changing things in the DOM that need to be changed. React, or sorry, reconciliation houses the diffing algorithm uh, that determines what parts of the, that tree need to be replaced. So let's take a look at some of that. There's some examples. Let's say that we have um, two components. The user is viewing a list of products. Um, or we're looking at a list of products, and then maybe we tap or click on one uh, to see an individual product. What's actually happening internally? So remember, we have our tree, right? So we have wrapper, and then we have product list, and that's what we ended up with. Um, when, whenever the root of elements uh, have different types, React tears down the whole tree, and it builds a whole new tree from scratch. And the reason for that is their type has changed. So if I flip back over to take a look at our element, if that type changes, so if main were to become, say, div, everything beneath it gets blown away. And the reason for that is that if the type is changing, um, we, we're not going, sorry, so let's back up. We are, we're building reusable components, right? So if we have a product list, and then we're changing to view an individual product, they're not the same thing. So React can just make the assumption, hey, calculating prompts and state, I'm just going to chuck this out the window and just this new thing. So when tearing down a tree, all DOM nodes are destroyed, right? So this does end up generating HTML, which we'll get to more on how that actual process works in a second. Um, the old DOM nodes are destroyed. Component instances will receive component will on mount, and the equivalent use effect hook will fire. Uh, so then we start building up the new tree, so all the, the new components are now there, and we're going to start rendering again. Um, the new DOM, noted, DOM nodes are inserted to the DOM, and then components in receive uh, component will mount, and then component did mount, uh, and then functional components will you have their use, of, use effect hooks uh, run as appropriately. Uh, any state associated with the old tree is lost. So 
breaking that down a little bit, um, React isn't reusing DOM elements. It's, it's actually destroying them and recreating them every time an element gets generated. So there, there's some stuff happening, some magical glue happening in the middle, but you can think of having an element correlating directly to a DOM node. So if that element changes, the DOM node changes. If that element goes away, the DOM node goes away. Uh, and there's, there's some more, what happens if they get moved around, or what happens if uh, some properties change, like how does React know which one is which? We'll get to that in a moment. I just want to spend a little time kind of focusing on, there are some actual under the hood differences as to what happens between um, just native HTML elements and then component, and, uh, sorry, so native um, DOM elements, excuse me, and component elements. So remember that React makes a distinction between those two types of elements. Um, so in this case, the class name is changing. Uh, when finally rendered, React finds the DOM node and just modifies the class name. No need to change everything, anything else because it's all the same. Uh, and then React will recurse on any children. In our case, we, we don't. This is not semantic, don't write this code. Um, <laughs> all right, so using a component instance, um, let's say we're viewing an individual product. Maybe I'm looking at some shoes found a sweet deal on something, but then I saw at the bottom on those related products, I'm like, I want those instead. Never full price, that's fine. Under the hood though, what's really happening, right? We made an API call, we got our, or sorry, so really it's like, oh, I'm gonna click on this and the ID changes. So that's really the prop that would end up changing at, like, at a higher level. Um, so when a component element updates, the instance stays the same. It is maintained across render, so we still have the same component instance, so remember, component, component instance, element, that component instance is staying the same. Uh, so React updates the prop of the underlying component instance to match this new element we're gonna generate. So then the render method is called, the diff, the diff algorithm recurses on the previous result and the new result, comparing previous to current, previous to current, until the end of the tree, or just nothing left to do, or nothing left to change, rather. All right. Uh, so remember how earlier how I mentioned that elements have that key attribute and that it's useful for differentiating between children? Let's take a look at that. All right, so in this list, I just have a simple unordered list with two list items. Uh, and then let's add an item to the end. It becomes this. So React compares the previous first item in the list to the next first item. Sees that they're the same, so it says first, first. All right, these are the same. Then it says second, second, cool, these are the same. And then it's like, oh, old doesn't have a third, new has a third, I'll insert a third item. <laughs> Pretty straightforward, right? There's nothing more complicated to it than that. All right, another list. List of movies. Well, movie and show, I guess. What happens if we add one to the beginning instead of the end? Well, as it stands, React doesn't know that these are different things. I know that, you know that, to React, it just says, it doesn't, sorry, so React doesn't know that we added one to the beginning. It just sees that Star Wars changed to Spaceballs, so it's like, cool, generate a new element, generate a new DOM node, or rewrite this, yeah, destroy the old DOM node, regenerate a new one. Star Trek has changed to Star Wars, cool, make the updates. And then it sees, hi, it's sweet, I got a new one, I'm gonna add it to the bottom. Not a super big deal on a small list like this, but you can see if maybe we have some kind of WebSocket going on and we're doing like a live polling of data. Um, this can get really expensive if you have a thousand or two thousand things in a list. Uh, so if you're doing a change every second, this kind of operation is where something can get really, really expensive and bogged down performance. Uh, it's super wasteful to recreate everything every time. So instead what we can do is add keys. A Little bit of bias here you can see. Um, by adding keys, we're able to indicate to React which elements are still the same so that as few DOM manipulations can occur as possible. You hear that I keep bringing up DOM manipulations. That's, that's like, that is ultimately what the goal of React was uh, designed to solve, right? Is so that we're, we're touching the DOM as little as possible. Um, and so that we're able to express this in like a very, very simple way. Uh, so let's take a look at what happens if we add one or prepend one to the beginning of the list. What happens is that React looks at the keys and it sees that, hey, first key is actual best. This other one has a key of best. It's like, let me hang on and look at the second one. And it sees that if I go through the diffing algorithm and, oh, sorry, so if I go down the list and I see that the keys are the same, it actually knows, oh, the only thing that's actually changed is this prepending. 
And so it just inserts it at the beginning. So again, going back to the example of if like we have some like live polling data that we're doing and we're like rapidly polling, and maybe we're adding one a second, that's that's a very simple change in a list of a thousand or even ten thousand, right? We're just one, 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 one. That's really easy. The user has no ill ill performance. Uh, the browser doesn't get bogged down. There's no painting happening, no restyling happening. It's just that one element that's changing. So this is what code would look like that of right, right? So you're mapping over an item. So if we have a product list and we want to render it out, this is typically what that looks like. Um, this is an example of what not to do. Uh, so you'll notice the key is equal to index. I'm sure that you've read this before, but the explanations that I've always found online aren't always clear, concise. Um, the reason is that the index can change. So if I am viewing an alphabetical list, so A to Z, and I invert that, the bottom is now the top, right? Well, React's going to compare keys, and they may or may not have changed. Um, th th this is the worst world where you want, where it'll look and see the old key is exactly new to the new key, and then it won't re-render. Um, or in the case of like a completely br new array, uh, it'll just re-render everything, even though that the elements are largely the same. Um, so we can solve this by some using something unique. Um, so if React sees that we're, sorry, so we're using I, an ID, and if I shift this from being top to bottom, React just moves those DOM elements. It just literally will invert the list for us. Uh, if you don't have a unique identifier um, in your data, maybe it's something that the user has generated, so a server didn't give you a list of IDs back with this, but it's okay. Um, there's a load of tool, different tools that you can use. Uh, my favorite to use is from Lodash. Uh, you don't have to import the whole library even. You can just import the unique identifier, um, and it will just literally give a unique ID and, and keep it so throughout the lifeline of your app. Um, you can also use UUIDs if you want to. It's a little more expensive, and I don't recommend that, um, but there are tools to do this. Um, I, I kind of make this a rule on my team that we always do this, even if the list doesn't change, even if we're not going to sort it, even if there's only five items in the list right now. You don't want to, um, from, it's a way of future proofing or defensive coding. So it's like if I, if I just go ahead and use this unique identifier in my item right now, if I suddenly one day have 10,000 items in a list, I don't ever have to think about this again. It's just automatically going to be more performant than if I had done it the other way. Um, so huge call out. This is a, likely a source of bugs that people have that they don't even realize are happening. Um, but more importantly, um, what I want to point out is that uh, the diffing algorithm is able to do um, switching of elements amongst children. This doesn't happen if you shift children. And what I mean is, let's say that we had another unordered list here, um, and we moved a child to be like a child's child, if that makes sense. React isn't going to pay attention that the key shift or move downward. It's only going to be amongst children. Um, so you can't move parent to child, kind of that relationship. That's just going to be considered a new element. Um, also note the keys are, they are just strings. Uh, so you can have spaces, you can have characters, it doesn't really matter. React is literally just doing strict comparison. They just have to be the same, that's all that matters. Um, for consistency, I usually recommend not, not doing something like this. Um, but most of us are probably going to end up using an ID because we're probably dealing with data from a server. So anyways, just pointing out edge cases and stuff like that. All right. All right. And then finally, or not finally, well, mostly finally, we'll get to rendering. Um, all right. So we have a pretty decent understanding of the virtual DOM. Um, so just kind of walking back through things. So we have a component. We get a component instance. It generates an element. And then ends up in the DOM somehow. That's what we're going to talk about next. It's a little anticlimactic. This, this function that we write one time or create React app generated for you at the beginning of your project is, is how this happens. Um, the render function off React DOM is responsible for kicking off the reconciliation process. So it does the whole generate the virtual DOM, generate that tree of elements, and uh, actually insert it into the DOM. Um, I want to point out uh, that React DOM is, does not come from the React library. And the reason for that is that React's job is to just do the diffing. That's all that it's responsible for. It doesn't actually know that you're generating HTML. And this is how React and React Native work. Um, React and React DOM used to be bundled in one library. They used to be one. And I think it was in version 13 or 14 that they split out. Might have been a little earlier than that. Um, so in theory, 
React is compatible with any uh, kind of DOM insertion tool that you want to generate. Um, I think I saw one for BlackBerry some time ago. Um, I tried to find it for a link for this talk, but I couldn't, so I guess it, I guess it died. Um, but it was like the fact that it existed at all, I was like, this is really cool. Someone figured out how to get this to build BlackBerry apps. Um, so again, the whole, the whole point of the React library, or the, what's happened, like the crux of it, is that, diffing, is that diffing process and the expression process for you, the developer, so that you don't have to think about what's actually happening under the hood. Um, This is an example of what it looks like to kick off a React Native uh, rendering process. A um, little bit different syntax, but largely the same. You just have to register a component uh, for the mobile application, uh, and then your app essentially is passed in as a function. Um, the actual rendering process um, is done through React Fiber, and this is a bit of a magical, mystical thing. Uh, Fiber is also pretty, is pretty new. It came out in the past year. Um, the, the promise of Fiber is that it gives us non-blocking renders. Um, it allows us to pause work, restart work, or just straight up say, I don't want this anymore. Um, an example of that is, uh, think of like maybe you have a use effect, um, or on your component did mount, you have a series of like APA calls that you're making. Fiber actually allows the whole component to just say stop right in the middle of that process, I don't care anymore. Um, if you've used suspense at all, there's, it's not really production ready or there's, the usefulness of that has not come out yet. Um, fiber is really what powers that. So what's actually happening under the hood is that when you, you um, we have an element and then we have our DOM node, the fiber is what sits between and actually does those insertions for us. Um, Actually getting into, like, does React using, like, write inner HTML? Uh, that's something I actually still don't know the answer to. Um, I, I actually did, like, quite a bit of pouring through the actual React library. Um, it's very complicated. Uh, it makes a lot of sense. Um, it used to not quite be this way, actually. So f I, I didn't even really truly understand the power of what Fiber is about to bring us uh, until I started researching this talk. Um, there's a lot of really cool things that are about to come out because of this. Um, our applications are about to get way, way cooler, I think. Uh, it's also maybe a little more complicated. Um, you can do some really interesting things like dynamic imports, meaning that you can wait until you actually need a component before it even gets imported. Uh, what this, this, has, this has effects for very large applications where maybe you have thousands of components and why do I need them all like available? Why can't I just say if the user clicks that weird modal thing that nobody really accesses, like load the component then. That's the kind of thing that you'll be able to do. And, uh, but as far as the talk today, um, the idea is that we have that element, we have a DOM node, and the fiber is what handles that writing process for us. All right, and so with that, you have a pretty, underst pretty thorough understanding of how React starts with a component and ends with HTML. I'll review that just one more time. So we end up with a component that we wrote, we get a component instance. It deduces state. It takes props. It computes them. And then it generates us a tree of elements. That tree of elements is our virtual DOM. And then with that, uh, that's handed, that's started through the reconciliation process. It's handed off to the rendering process. And either React DOM or the component registration process for React Native takes that and actually generates the DOM nodes or the uh, internal view components for a React Native app. Uh, that are the views that the user sees. Uh, and that's my talk. If you want to find me on Twitter, uh, I'm at callmetwan. Uh, I tweet about JavaScript and cats. Thanks, guys. <laughs>